Most of the girls during their menstrual periods will miss at least a week of school because they do not have access to these products, they do not have access to clean water to be able to maintain themselves to play period. They do not have access to the medical care that they may need sometimes when we have crops and you're just not able to focus on that sort of thing. But if the, gener if the school management is gender responsive, then they're able to recognize that they need to have uh, em emergency sanitary towels. If case that now messes up our pants, traditionally boys will laugh at you over. That's enough for you not to lose. We've had cases in Kenya where girls have forgot kids to set because of the stigma and shame that comes with being laughed at in school. And not only by the students, but also by the teachers. But if there's a gender responsiveness within the school, starting from the top of the management, having that to the teachers and to the parents, <coughs> then the environment is safe for a girl to learn. Providing the number of toilets. In a school, they, in a school there are four toilets. And they did provide them as four for two for girls and two for boys. That's not being gender responsive. Because four boys can go to the toilet at the same time. And four girls can go at the same time. They need more space, they need more time, they need more facilities. So being able to notice that and friendly create a better way for girls to access sanitation than in the uh, having access to water. Uh, recently, we implemented the GRP training in Nigeria, where I did from one side, right? a very lovely place. And as a result of the gender responsive training, the school management in all the three schools we visited in Adabawa State have implemented sanitation for the girls. They have ensured that girls have proper when it's basic. They have ensured that they have access to sanitation in the, the school. One of the schools, uh, created a first aid box where they donate, like the, I think the teachers donate a uh, sanitary towel such that a girl is able to avoid get one without feeling embarrassed or feeling shame. They did not have school toilets dedicated for girls. They were school, the toilets were only dedicated for the teachers because they don't have the infrastructure. But the principal went ahead and put aside two toilets for the teachers and two toilets for the girls. So you can only imagine that during a girl's menstruation, she will be comfortable to attend school and not have to worry that she may miss her dress or she may not have the necessary um, equipment or sanitation that she needs. Another thing that GRP has um, advanced in schools is greater participation in class. Because the examples are relatable, the seating arrangement, not girls on one side, boys on one side, and girls at the back and boys at the front, just integrating them and including them. It helps in ensuring that girls are able to participate and not think that this side thing is a guy's thing or this math is just not for girls. Having that interactive and inclusive um, class setup and examples and learning material really does encourage girls to participate in class. So I'm just going to give you a bit more context into the Sierra Leonean um, space that where we are based. Sierra Leone is a country where we have a lot of culture norms, and among these norms, we have like female genital mutilation. So for us, one of the things that stuck with me, and I think I was overwhelmed, was the time we placed fellows in 2021. That was our first cohort. And after just a time, so it was just seven, three months after the Christmas period, was for them to return back to placement, and so, all the girls in classes five and classes six, not in school. Please. And I'm talking about the age bracket of about 10 to 12 years old. And this is about 50 girls, almost 50 girls. And these girls in classes six also need to attain the national primary school exams in year six. And if they're going to be taken into some form of um, initiation, Missing out six to eight weeks of town time, that's serious and it's alarming. So the fellows now along actually were very, very intentional about just trying to see what is possible, the solutions that they can bring. They started engaging their coaches, started engaging us at the National HQ as to what we can actually do. And the ideas actually emerged that we need to start engaging parents at cluster levels 
engage the chiefs because they are the tribal authorities, and also people in the Ministry of Education because they're responsible for the school survey operating. And what's those ideas, and it took a while like for them to even give attention to the, the fellows so that we can be able to get the message across that what we're doing is not literally wrong. We respect the culture, but just taking them out of town time and you expect a child to gain excellent grades to the national primary exams, that there's no magic in that. It wasn't at all a work in the park. It took us about nine to 12 months to be able to engage all of these stakeholders in this particular community called Senel in South Sierra Leone. And I'll never forget this date. That was on the 3rd of October, 2021, when I had a call from the chief, the town chief, and he told me, we want to see you and your people to engage in a meeting. And we got to this meeting, and they were like, we like the work your people are doing, they're engaging, they're showing us a bit more, um, another picture of what life can be and what we can actually give to our children that will stay with them. And when we're in that meeting, they ask us, what exactly do you want us to do? Is that we want you guys to work with us so that we can be able to have certain rules around girls' education. Because taking them for FGN, yes, it's nice, but taking them during town time, school times, we are medically. The time is 12 weeks, so if you're taking out for eight weeks, that's serious. And as a mom, if I have to deprive my daughter out of school for that long, then it's something worrisome. And then we engaged, engaged, have conversations, and at the end, we're able to establish bylaws in that community that no parent, no one is allowed to take, not just a girl, but also boys, that they also boy initiations out of school. The culture stays, but what we are asking for is allow people to learn, and especially girls. And every communities now have to emulate what came out of Senegal. Places like the Lewanon, the Southern Syria, where we also place literally had similar bylaws, and this has also been replicated in the aspects of child and child marriages. Some of the things that are alongside have shared with Wendy, and for us, it's about engagement, it's about mindset. You know, those values, those laws have been there even before I was born, before my mom, my, my, my sisters, my aunties. But how do you engage? And also the response of the communities, and also to put another vision, because on our own, we will not be able to do it. We have the parents who are like, yes, receptive of what we're saying. We're not forceful. We also have people in the places of our and those who are intentional about changing finances. So this is something we want to continue doing and see how best that can also help our girls achieve their potential. Thank you. Now, everybody is confident that how violent Boko Haram is. Now, the Fail violence is permeating down from the leaders to the boys. So do you not understand why we now start to begin to think about how important it is when we're talking about gender responsive education to include the boys. The boys need to understand that this power dynamic has to change. The fact that you are in charge of what you are in control does not mean you know that you should not understand or you should not um, you know, um, be able to relate to the kind of force, to the kind of abuse, to the kind of suffering that is going on. And unfortunately, we also find that the majority of these boys are actually illiterate. They have absolutely no education whatsoever. So we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we don't begin to think about educating boys as part of this gender. I now give you sort of lots of examples. It is the same issue that in um, Kony in um, Uganda. It's the same issue in, I have the list of uh, the lost resistance army in Uganda. It's the same issue we see with the conflict in Iran and Syria. It's the same problem we're seeing with the conflict in South Sudan. Even in Cambodia, conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And a lot of the violence is being perpetrated by boys 
who has no sense of justice, empathy, or whatever it is. Now, I think examples of places where gender responsive education has actually made a huge change. Um, sorry, I'm quite old, so I have to sort of go through my name. I'm thinking I'm in different web as well. Um, so some of the places in which gender responsive education has made a difference is actually in places like Rwanda, um, where they have sort of educated the boys because they understand just that it's important um, for them to be part of rebuilding the country and um, promote reconciliation because they found out that um, they had to create education programs that challenge traditional gender roles and stereotypes, which is actually what part of the problem is here. And same thing in Somalia as well. Um, they needed to understand that to begin to deal with the conflict in the affected regions, um, it was really important to educate boys about the importance of gender equality and peaceful conflict resolution. So very quickly, what are the areas that we would like to focus gender education for boys on? is breaking gender stereotypes, building inclusive communities, so that you understand that boys and girls have a role to play in the community. Uh, and then promoting solidarity, boys need to be able to empathize with what girls are going through. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, we'd like to hear from Tamara, and I'd like you to share your experience with us. Um, do you feel like you've been supported to achieve your dreams? And if you have, why do you think that has been? If you haven't, why? How much of it has been tied to gender? You know, in, when you think about the opportunities that you have or you do not have, is it based on the fact that you're female? So just share your experiences with us, we'd like to hear. When it comes to my experience, I mean, in our school we are very modern when it comes to these type of situations because from top management, they usually like, they show us even through our textbooks, the challenges that we used to go through in the past when it includes gender or even right now in the present. But it has kind of decreased because when we were taught from a young age, I think it was grade two, we were taught from a young age on these challenges that we face or challenges that rural areas might face with that include their gender. And you know, they used to show us by like both perspectives. They used to show us the male and the female perspective. Like for the girls, it's how maybe we can be told that we need to do this work for our needs or human trafficking or even the FGM. And they also showed us for boys that some boys that they can go through child labor in the rural areas and be told not to go to school. So we kind of understood that it's really important to include both sides. And right now it's fine actually. The only thing is the small stereotypes that uh, like the people who are there who are still in the past, like the past perspectives, like what has happened before all of this, like there are some teachers who might be older, they are used to like older aspects and most of them can be stereotypes. Others are younger and they kind of understand these modern things. So when we go to the older teachers, they start feeling like they need to focus on this type of sector of gender more than the other because, for example, the reason they can do that for the boys, they need to support the boys, is because female, the female sector is being supported a lot. And it might be continuing, the challenges might be continuing, but they might think that as we are being supported, we are making the boy child look invisible. And they don't see that, so they feel like they need to raise the voice for the boy child. When it goes to supporting the female sector, they see that they need to support the female sector because the challenges are still there. And the boy child 
might have had more of an opportunity in the past and even right now. Like for example, <laughs> I remember this week, there were some girls in our class who wanted to play football and boys in our class wanted to play football. Now it is Thursday. We know that we are we have some free time during Thursday and Friday evenings. But on Friday evenings we are washing the class. So we want to be very free. Now, on Thursday evenings is mostly games time because we're in our track suit. Now the first week there was week one, two and three. Like this is week three. <laughs> so the first week the boys said that they want to play with will play next week. And then we were like, okay, so we made an agreement. That was okay. But then when it continued into week two, we were told, the boys told us that we can't play because we don't know how to play. And I don't know, it felt kind of insulting because they haven't even like ever cared to see us play. By us, I mean the girls who are playing because I don't know how to play. Um, but for the ones who are actually talented in that, they, their skill wasn't acknowledged because of that stereotype that girls don't know how to play soccer as much as boys do, which kind of felt very insulting to the girl child. And then again, when you try your best to support the girl child, like some people might say feminists are doing too much and they, there has to be some equal support in both sides. So when it comes to my experience, sometimes we might feel supported equally, probably by now the new teachers, but the old teachers might also feel the same way. Like in that situation, they might support the boys more. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tamara. <laughs> Very articulate. Thank you. Um, Rachel, you've taught in classrooms and with the work you're currently doing as well, how much of what Tamara just shared can you relate with and just let us understand your own experiences? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's working. Yeah, I can really relate well with what Tamara said because some of her experiences have like unveiled themselves in the classroom that I teach. If I can give example, um, I was stationed at a low-income community called Mukuru Kwanjenga, where it's a, slum, it's a slum school, but under a slum community. So you find that most of the parents, they were like sending boys to school and then leaving girls. Additionally, they were, for example, if we are having examinations, you could find that these parents they have maybe two kids, a sister and a brother, in the same school, but they will prefer paying school fees for the boy child, but not the girl child. Another one is about the, just the community, the stereotypes of how like, women or girls are not supposed to be in schools. That one was there, evidently. And so as a teacher, as a Teach for Kenya alumni, I, sorry, as a Teach for Kenya fellow during that time, I came up with like, strategies to include the gender responsive education. Like during parents meeting, I will encourage the parents to always like support their girl child because there's a quote that says, when you empower a girl child, you empower the whole community. Also inside my classroom, I was able like to offer equal opportunities to both girls and boys. The way Tamara has shared, like for example, if boys are going to play football, like they're supposed to be like, combine and play that football. If boys know how to play better, they can teach girls how to play. Another one was about, uh, I really conducted trainings on teachers because um, in our communities, girls were facing gender-based violence and uh, we were taking males to be champions. So there was uh, this, um, it's called what? Like we went into the street, then we had masking tape saying, say no to gender-based violence. And we were urging community members, those people who ride motorcycles, to join us. And to surprise, they really joined us, saying that this is our sisters. You are not supposed like to make them suffer in any kind of way. And so extending that to our teachers, training them on the importance of gender sensitive and awareness and the culture of, of respect. And then lastly, last but not least, foster on inclusive classroom whereby we had open discussion between boys and girls, like asking boys, 
how can we support our girls then they give feedback as young as they are same to girls yeah thank you